This program is brought to you by Emory University. One of the most interesting, crazy, incredible cases of American jurisprudence deals with Scottsboro. Again, you can't understand unless you've got the context of the Great Depression. You have folks riding the rails looking for work just because they can't afford to, you know, I'll go find this job here. So they're just hopping on a train and riding in trying to find work wherever they can find work. Well, what happens at, in the Scottsboro case is you have nine black teenagers and some of them get in a fight on the train with a couple of white guys. The train stops in Scottsboro you know, because this fight has broken out. As they're getting off the train, as the sheriff's folks are there, the white guys get off, the black guys get off, and then two white women get off. And the townsfolk are looking around going, oh. And the white women, because you've got black guys and white women in Alabama in the early 1930s, I believe 1932. It's like, whoa. And the women, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates yell rape and say that these nine black teenagers rape them. The town immediately whoo, took the nine kids, hauled them in jail. There was a one day trial for these nine kids that ranged from the age of like 12 or 13 to 17, known as the Scottsboro Boys. In this trial, Victoria Price described the uh, uh, horrific rape. Well, the problem was, was that the doctor who had examined these women said, mm, there's no evidence of rape here. But that didn't stop the jury. The, the doctor now didn't testify that there was no evidence of rape. But it was very clear that he knew there was no evidence of rape. And he had told folks there was no evidence of rape. These nine black teenagers were convicted. And rape was an executable offense in the 1930s. And so in a one-day trial, eight of them were sentenced to die in the electric chair. The youngest was sentenced to life imprisonment in an Alabama prison. Now, there are multiple problems with that story. One, Ruby Bates, one of the women who had yelled rape, recanted, said it didn't happen. Now, let me tell you what really happened here. We're prostitutes. <laughs> and the Mann Act, the Federal Mann Act, says that we were afraid of getting, because you can't cross state lines for immoral purposes. And since we crossed over uh, out of Tennessee and Alabama, we were afraid that we might get brought up on federal charges. So we were just trying to protect ourselves. And so we just said, mm, rape. Another part of the problem was that first, the, the Communist Party's legal wing hopped in there and took this case up to the Supreme Court to try to protect the Scottsboro Boys. Then the NAACP hopped in it. But one of the major Supreme Court decision was the Powell v. Alabama decision that came after this. Because think about this. You're on trial for your very life, for a crime that never happened. Your court-appointed attorneys, one is the town drunk. I believe at the time he may have had a blood alcohol level of 0.2. I mean, lit. The other attorney in a capital case is probably in about the fourth stages of senility. So one of your attorneys is senile, looking for butterflies, and the other one is drunk, seeing butterflies. Now, the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court in the 1930s went, really? No, come on. <laughs> You, you, come on, this is just too much even for us. And they remanded the case, they kicked the case back down out, you gotta try these fellas again. Well, what happens now that they've got a real legal team is that they began to construct the train and found out that many of the Scottsboro boys weren't even on the, in the same car as the women. 
So how can a rape happen if the guys aren't in that car? They were convicted once again. Case goes back up to the Supreme Court. By the time there, there were so many egregious constitutional errors in this case that by the time the Scottsboro case is done, and eventually they start getting let out one by one by one by one, it took first 18 years for the last one. Imagine being in prison, in an Alabama prison. You are 17. You get out when you're 35 for a crime that never happened a crime where one of the women has recanted, a crime where the evidence demonstrates that it, you, you couldn't have done this thing. This would be called mm, an egregious wrong. You also had several who had escaped. Imagine trying to escape from an Alabama chain gang, but they managed to get out. Michigan refused, they, the Alabama tracked one down up into Michigan. Michigan refused, and think about this, a state refusing to extradite a convicted felon back to Alabama because Michigan looked up and said, Shh, this is wrong. This is just wrong. The last one was pardoned by Governor George Wallace sometime, I believe, in the 1980s. So imagine again, basically living in the shadows for almost 40, 50 years because of something that never happened, the charge of rape. I mean, Scottsboro speaks to so much in the criminal justice system. But what you also get in this is a series of Supreme Court decisions dealing with the right to competent counsel, thank God, and the, the right to have a jury that is really truly a jury of your peers. Now, that is some amazing, amazing jurisprudence that is coming out of this case of horrific, egregious, um, unjust, justifiable. I, I have no more words for what happened at Scottsboro, um, but an egregious wrong that, in my eyes, has never been righted. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.